Welcome to the house of the Lord. Those of you joining us online, good morning to you also. We're in Paul's letter to the Romans. We have a topical message this morning, and if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. The text will be verse 18. And for the to save time, we'll just take that verse where we stand and read in a moment. This will be a hot seat sermon because it singles all of us out. There will not be one exception to what the Lord has to say, and hopefully it will make us stronger. Well, would you stand for the reading of God's word, please? Romans chapter 7, verse 18. And if you're watching online and you're able, why don't you stand with us for the reading of God's word? Romans 7, verse 18, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Please be seated. I did want to take the, uh, more of that section, but again, to save time, I felt that that verse would be enough. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And the title of the message is The Flesh. I stopped midway in that text, just reading that part of it, because I don't want to draw attention away from that dominant point, my flesh. There's nothing good about my flesh. And we'll have to get into a little bit what that means. And perhaps some of it has to do with I think, well, I think all pastoring from the pulpit has to do with that simple verse from the prophet Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And a pastor should know that ignorance is not a virtue amongst God's people. We are to know what God's word says about as many things as we can get. And looking at our youth today, be they going online or in the neighborhood or hanging out with their friends, I've been noticing this disconnect that they've been coming to church and hearing about the Bible, and then they act as though they've never come to church and heard about the Bible, many of them, some of them, uh, once they leave. And they're not making this connection that God will hold them accountable, that this is not uh, a game, and that they have a responsibility to live what they believe, what they claim to believe. If you say you're a Christian, then start pursuing the Christian life. But in doing that, in pursuing the Christian life, your flesh is going to get in the way, and you're going to have to learn how to deal with this, or else Satan will take you out. And this is true for all of our lives, for all of us. It is a lifetime struggle. This passage, for I know that in my flesh, that is, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Yes, it applies to the unbeliever, but it, it really he's talking to believers. He's really addressing those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and the struggle that we face. And if you understand nothing else this morning, you will understand the text that I've already repeated several times. There is nothing in me acceptable to God so long as I am removed from God. And and Paul, trying trying to reach believers, he's, he's in Corinth, when he writes this letter, so he's surrounded by Christian carnality. He's surrounded by Christians that were just doing, not not all of them again, but many of them were just living like like God never said a word about sin. Every sexual immorality, uh, uh, self-righteousness, what's called narcissism, uh, it's everything. There were those in that congregation doing business with the devil and carefree about it. And, of course, he he tried to educate them. He did a good job. He he, he succeeded, largely succeeded in doing this. Jeremiah writes, thus says Yahweh, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from Yahweh. So the part is not so much about the man trusting man in the street. The part is departing from the Lord. That's where the curse is. Just ask Cain. 
just ask many other characters that we come across in the scripture. My flesh is that part of me removed from God. Even though I could fully save, going to heaven, serving the Lord, I still have a part of me. And of course, for those of you who drive, you know the easy, the easy example of you getting in the flesh is when you drive. Now, it's okay to recognize that the other person doesn't know how to drive, but then we begin adding names to the other person. We've never met them. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's probably all the humor you're going to get this morning on this top subject. And look at with me if you still have Romans open. And I, I don't want to intimidate you. It's not, I'm not, it's not a sermon to beat us up. Hopefully we're edified by these things. But it forces us to look in the mirror. And sometimes it's the very thing we don't want to do. If you've ever had a wound, a nasty cut, you don't want to look under the Band-Aid. At least I don't. I just want to hurry and get that thing out of my sight. But for wound care, you have to. You have to look. In verse 14... Uh, cutting towards the end of verse 14, he says, but I am carnal, sold under sin, verse 15, for what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. You see, when you read it, you, you might miss the tone, the inflection of a man who loves the Lord but himself struggles. And I'm not, you know, some of the commentators, and they like to try to make it sound like Paul, that he's not talking about himself. Why not? Why is he not talking about himself? Of course he is. He's in this mess just like the rest of us. He's not Jesus. Jesus Christ could not say this about himself. Christ was never in, he was in the physical flesh. I'll get to that distinction in a little bit. But he was never, his soul was never, going contrary to his father. He says, I always do those things, my father. Uh, I always do those things that please my father. In verse 16, looking at Romans 7, again, he says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with scripture that it is good. He says the law, but he's talking about the scripture. And he is saying, if I didn't believe in the Bible, I would be carefree. I wouldn't have to worry about the sin that I commit. But I do believe in God's word. And I do find that I, I fail. I fail to live up to it. Not in everything. Only it takes one thing. And he's coming out and his readers are saying, thank you, Lord. We have a man of God who is where we are, struggling with what we struggle with and still bringing us God because the Holy Spirit is in him. And perhaps the most pronounced example, in, or at least at the top, there may be others, but one of the most pronounced examples of the mercy of God with sinners in this condition is King David, a man that God never stopped using all of his life. We read about in his old age, he is still throwing out the blessings. He is still writing scripture. He is still a man God has not turned his back on in spite of his shortcomings. David could have wrote, wrote this long before Paul came along. And in many ways he did. Cast me not from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. In verse 21, Paul writes, I find then a law. That evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Well, why do you will to do good, Paul? Because I love Jesus Christ. Because he intercepted me on that Damascus road. And he's poured into me his Holy Spirit. He goes on, oh, wretched man that I am. He elevates it. He goes from saying, I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing, to saying, I am wretched before God. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then, of course, he tells us. He gets to that first verse in what we call Romans 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of it is swept away by the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from most sins. Of course not. It does not cleanse us from most sins. All sins if you come to Christ. And if you do not come to Christ, no sins. 
It's a take it or leave it, all or nothing proposition. And it should be because it cost him his blood. He could have stayed in heaven where it was nice and cozy. But he came here, the very place we can't wait to leave. The body becomes a hiding place for evil passions through the flesh. All of us have to deal with it. We parents, we see it in our children. And we, we scramble, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to intercept this? How are we going to deal with this? We try to tell them Bible stories and bring them to church and set the example. And the whole time we're praying to the Lord that it's received. Because I struggle with sin, I must not approve sin. And we see that. We see people who's, who run into things and they cave in. And that's the very thing Paul is telling the Christians and Romans not to do. He says, essentially, it's worth staying in the fight, taking the hits, realizing that you're not all that, but Christ is. You younger ones, again, what are you going to do with this when you leave here? What are you going to do with this when you get back out around your friends, when you get back out into the neighborhood, in the world, wherever you find? What are you going to do? You're going to side with them? You're going to change uniforms? Wear your Christian uniform when you go to church and then take that off and wear the world of per, uh, the uniform of perversity when you're around your buddies because you want them to accept you? At your age now, stand up to them. Make that confession like Ruth. Your God will be my God. When you die, I will die. You die on the cross, I'll die on the cross. That's Christianity. No one said it was easy. And if they did, they didn't know what they were talking about. The struggle of saved souls. That is what we're talking about. The believer's lifetime struggle. James writes, where do wars and fights come from among you? Now we know James was fierce about the law that brings us this knowledge of just what sin is. And that's what Paul was teaching in Romans 6 and 7. The law tells us that these things hurt us. And James says, well, where does all this stuff come from? Do they come from, he says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members, in your body, inside of you, in your flesh? He is right. It comes from me. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? Because that is what the flesh is all about. And that's why, especially you younger Christians, you get tripped up so easily. You think that people are interfering with your fun, and sometimes they are. They have to. Put a young teen behind a sports car, a wheel of a sports car, a full tank of gas, and you could have a recipe for a crime scene. Peter writes, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What would you expect from a man of God to tell a congregation? He says, stay away from those things, knowing that there are just some things we just have to we just struggle with. Ephesians, so we have James, we have Peter, we have Paul ringing in, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And so there is, there's the apostle Paul calling that old nature that we turn away from, that past lifestyle. That was the old way of doing it. Now you have the new way in Christ, the new life, the newness in Christ. Now look again with me if you have your Bibles open. Verse 14. I don't know how much of this I'll take. We're not even digging in yet. He says, for we know, in verse 14, that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So there's that realization and admission. Is, I am sweeping this. I'm not sweeping this under the rug. This is how it is. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. And he just continues to bring this out until he concludes that I am wretched. And Christ, knowing, knowing what Christ says about him, I love you as you are. I won't leave you the way you are. And when you get to heaven... You will never be this way again. That is the Christian life. And again, I fear that some Christians are ignorant of just how their flesh takes control, how it surges forward. I, I think it helps when we understand, hey, this is my flesh. 
Because when we don't do that, what do we do? We blame the other person. But when we realize, wait, no, I'm out of bounds. It's me. Our flesh is the runway which sin takes off from. I need to know that. I want to bomb that runway. Satan will rebuild it, and I'll bomb it again. When Peter said, how many times do I forgive my brother? Because Peter wanted to know how many times was he going to be forgiven. And Jesus said, it's an infinite number, Peter. What I'm more interested is in the sincerity and the truth. In Romans 6, Paul praises the scripture, the law, for its intended purpose. And what was that intended purpose? To identify sin. That's why the law came along. You shall not steal you shall not want what you do not, it does not belong to you. That's wrong for you to want. You're not to do these things and, and all the other things that are in the, not only the Ten Commandments, but throughout the law of God. And Paul says that scripture of ours, it has achieved its goal, but just knowing these things is not enough. It doesn't take away, it doesn't address what happens when I can't make it. Romans 7, verse 7, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetedness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. And Paul is saying, I, I, you know, I, I followed the law, but I, I, dealt, I dealt with covetousness, and I wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem until God said it's a problem. It is his prerogative. He's every right. He's always correct. Mankind is faced with th a three-headed monster. We know Satan. We know he's one of the monsters. We know the world. We just look at the news. Look at what the world is, how it's seducing our young children over to its side. While the whole time our children are saying, I'm a Christian. Not all of them, but enough of them. But I don't know that the third head of that monster is identifiable to some, and that is my own flesh. Now, this other, the flesh of other people, too. But we're talking about my flesh, that we put off our former conduct of that, that old man. And spiritually, before Christ, we are dead in our flesh and in our sin until we come to Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Never pulling punches, Paul, when it comes to truth but yet never being brutal with the truth. Always, just like the prophets, all of them, where they lay out the truth and they lay out the solution. And they were men with like passions, as, uh, just like us. He continues in Ephesians verse 5 of chapter 2, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. He's saying, God did not wait for you to get good enough to be saved. He saved you while you were a sinner, in your sin. He loved you then, at that moment. And that is grace. That is kindness you do not deserve from a holy God. But he, he gave it anyway. And because of that, we're saved from a judgment to come. Colossians 2, having forgiven you all trespasses. Micah told the Jews, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The flesh, the flesh says no. That's, I, the flesh says, I'm fine with all of that until I want something. And if any of those things, humility, justice, mercy, if any of those things get in my way, I'll push them down. They better not interfere with me. And so we listen to the reaction of the spiritual man again in verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And that is, of course, Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 8 of Romans, verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law, verse 4 of Romans 8, might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's that team we side with. We agree with the spirit, not the flesh. 
in spite of the struggles. We've not given up on God because we can't seem to be perfect. And so uh, the, these, uh, the, spirit, the spirit brings power, not the flesh, as he, just, as he just told us in verse 3 and 4. The flesh brings weakness. And the flesh can be the elephant in the room. Everybody knows it's there. No one wants to deal with it. But attempts to ignore it are counterproductive. That does not mean we overdo it. We do give space and we do give grace because God does with us. Satan wants us, he wants to use our external enemy, and, and that is the world, as well as the internal enemy, and that, of course, is our sinful nature, the flesh. And he wants to use them to defeat us. Mark chapter 14, Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And there is a dual application of the flesh. There is the physical body, which is not sinful in and of itself. And then there is the sinful, of the, the, the natural man, the soul. That is sinful, that will sin. The body is, of course, the vehicle for the soul. The soul is that part of me that interacts with man. That's where I am. But the Spirit only, and those who are born again, the Spirit of the Lord, is for those who have been touched by God. And so we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. But the unbeliever has a body and a, and a soul, and at best, a corrupted spirit. But the spirit really is dead. And it's not brought to life until they are touched by God, born again. Again, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaching them how to pray, said, do not lead us into temptation. He says, when you pray, say, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because he's got that runway in our flesh. He says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you'll get someone coming. Well, that part's not in the original writings. But is it true? Is it true? Is not God the power and the glory? So then why would you bring that up? The flesh, let's define it. There are two primary meanings in the Bible when it talks about the flesh. As I mentioned, the physical body of humans and animals, the animal kingdom as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 39, he says it right out. John's gospel, when John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten. He's talking about Jesus Christ and his being born of a virgin, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and we beheld him full of grace and truth. Someone says to you, I would like to see God. Okay, it's very easy. Let's turn to the Gospel of John. You just look at Jesus Christ. You see God. As Philip said, show us the Father, and it will suffice. Have you been with me so long? Have you not known, Philip? He who sees me has seen the Father. If that's not a declaration of deity, there's no such thing. This is why the, the doctrines of Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons are so egregious, because of their denial of the facts presented in Scripture. Acts chapter 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That is the physical body. And not speaking about that part of the soul that is Adamic connected to Adam's fall. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter was told by Jesus. When, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. No human being told you that. That information is exclusive. It comes from the Father. That's how you got it, Peter. And so, the, again, the flesh there and that context, flesh and blood, the physical body, not speaking of the uh, natural man, the, that nature of sin that we all have. When God removed a rib from Adam, when he created Eve, the Bible tells us that he closed up that place of the flesh, the body. And so I, yeah, some of this I just like to read. First Timothy, this is it. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. 
God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the wor world, and received up in glory. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Without controversy, God was manifested in the flesh, received up into glory. Who could that be? It's Christ. It's no one else. So when Satan comes along and makes you doubt that Christ, because of the, the, the theological language, makes you doubt that he is equal with the Father, then hurl these verses back at him. So our Lord, of course, adorned the physical flesh, but never the flesh of the soul, the fallen nature, the natural man. This flesh that we have is our old nature, and we inherited it from Adam and Eve when they sinned, a nature that is opposed to God and can do nothing spiritual to please God. There is nothing about the flesh that can please God. It is that bad. And so when as our text tells us, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there is no good things. He means every word that he's saying. Now, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, or maybe you have, you don't have, you have no proper understanding of who he is, then you're all shaken by, what are you saying? What are you saying? Well, I'm saying in your flesh is no good thing. That's what I'm saying. If I knew sign language, I'd do it in sign language and make sure you got it. Satan reigns over the body and the soul that is without Christ, and he attacks the soul and the body that is with Christ. He attacks both of them, really, but we are very sensitive to this because we know what's going on. The natural man, just again, and I'll cover this again later if I don't run out of time. The natural man is the man that is as he was born, in iniquity, untouched by God, a sinner, whether they are the nicer brand or the more evil brand, they are natural and they are doomed in that state. The carnal man, though this belongs to the natural man too, but essentially, or in context often in scripture, a Christian who is no longer a natural man can be carnal, can be petty, can be a, just a pain in the neck because they're not spiritual. And of course, then there is the spiritual man. And that is the Christian that is rowing as hard as they can row in the direction that Jesus has sent them in, uh, in the ship of service for the Lord. And so the meanings of the flesh are derived from their context in which they are used. In Romans 8, verse 8, when Paul says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not talking about those in flesh and blood. He's talking about those who are in the uh, line with that Adamic nature, that sinful nature, in that, in that state, you, you cannot please God. And when you are, if you happen to be driving and you're, a, you know, have, the flesh has launched you into a zone of sin, that does not please God. It does not mean you're damned and going to hell. It means you are in the flesh and that's not where God wants you. And that it can come with a high consequence. You know, road rage, you know, it's, it's, it, the flesh has no boundary. It doesn't care about you. The flesh can lead to your death or our death. I, you know, all of us, we're susceptible to this. Some more than others. Some have a disposition that accommodates the flesh in violent ways. Some in more sneaky ways, but we're all saddled with it. And so let's look at the flesh in action. Again, this, this flesh is the part of me that does not listen to God, the one that behaves opposite of God. Uh, it may get some things right, but it doesn't get, it, get right with who God is. Galatians 5, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish laying it out for us. I think most of you older Christians, you know all this, but you younger ones, have you thought this through? When you go back out into the world and you get around your friends that don't love Jesus Christ or say they do, but live like they serve the devil, are you going to be able to say to them, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't do that with you. If our friendship has to end, it ends here. If you want to rebuild this friendship, then repent with me. That's, that's how you handle it, I, one way. 
of how you handled it. But you can't take a stick and chase them around the room. That would be the flesh. But the spirit invites them in. Every vice, every single one known to man is born of the flesh. Temper tantrums, born of the flesh. Pettiness, the flesh. You know, pettiness, it, it, pettiness is a little fire, not a big one. How great a forest a little fire can kindle. Don't think, you know, fire is mean. And, and it is, uh, once it's out of control, it, it lives up to being out of control. And it will harm and hurt and devour. Vindictiveness, I'm going to get you back, spirit. Deceitfulness, meanness, rudeness. How about those who are moody and snappers? You know, they snap at you. Uh, you know, they, they well, I'm, I, I'm moody when I, until I have had my first cup of coffee, and then after that, I don't care that I'm moody. <laughs> it's a joke. Anyway, those who resent being told that they're in the flesh, those who resent being told when they're moody, those who resent being told, hey, why are you so snarky, when they know they're guilty? How does that work? How does it work when you know you're guilty, and yet you ramp it up against the one who is the victim of your guilt? Second Timothy, speaking about the end, the end times, which we are living in. We're living in the end of the end times. He says, for men will be lovers of themselves. Oh, let's all stop and take a selfie. I mean, <laughs> I mean sometimes it's a good reason to take a selfie, I'm, I'm sure, a before and after, uh, but, so for example. Uh, but uh, you, we, we've all seen how this is just out of control with some people. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's what, that's what Jeremiah was saying. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Stay away from them. You can't fix them. They're, they're irretrievable in that state. If they get to a place where they want to repent, then the door's open. Otherwise, it's on, you're on lockdown. Come out, come out, come out from among them, said the Apostle Paul. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. They really don't believe it. They're after something. Simon Magnus was doing this. Give me this power that I may lay hands on people. And have these kind of results. And Peter, what did he say? You are poisoned with bitterness and bound in iniquity. Called him out on it right away. Hopefully, he got it, Simon, and repented. He did ask to be forgiven. The flesh is more to blame than the devil of the world many times. Yeah, the devil does his dirt, but sometimes it's me. It's not Satan. Blaming others for my sin. Again, that Adamic nature playing the victim. Let's go back to it. Genesis chapter 3. What happened after they sinned? Well, what happened before they sinned? What was not present before they sinned? Blaming other people for their wrong. Once God called them out, the man said, the woman whom you gave to me. You did this, God. I was fine. <laughs> no, you weren't. Because when you saw her, you said, whoa. So, don't go throwing that back at me. Then what did the woman do? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. Yeah, because you were by the tree. All these trees here, why were you by that one hovering? So there's the Adamic nature right out the starting gate, refusing to own the guilt. It's liberating when, I mean, the wrong is the wrong and it's tough, but it is certainly liberating to say, oh, yeah, I submit. I did that rather than trying to hold it in and hide it. Always in conflict with agape love is the flesh. 1 Corinthians 13. The flesh is not in any of this. All of this is the spiritual man. Love suffers long and is kind. I put up for a long time with someone who makes me suffer. That's what that means. That's the goal. Love does not envy. Love does not... Parade itself is not puffed up. Pause here. 
remember the Corinthians, they were doing opposite of all these things. There was somebody in the church guilty of at least one of these things. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. That one I, I struggle with. I get provoked, and so do you. He continues, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all, endures all things. Paul, that is a very high standard. Yes, it is. And if you get half of it right, you will be knocking the devil upside his head. And that, that is attractive to me. The flesh will have none of it if it can't have its way, as I mentioned earlier. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Next time you're in a traffic jam, maybe if you have, you, some of you have to drive up north or that dreaded 64 toward the beach, and you're in a traffic jam, you're living out long-suffering. <laughs> Ephesians 5, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, now wait for it, truth. And truth, goodness and righteousness without truth is not good, is not righteousness. Where do we get this kind of truth? The scripture, the scripture alone. Scripture alone determines how we should behave. That's what the reformers were dying for when they said sola scriptura. The scripture alone defines for us how we shall thus live before the Lord. Luke chapter 8, 14. Now the ones... You'll know this one. Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. So if you have been blessed with material gains by God, and I don't use that word lightly. I mean, God has blessed you. He hasn't blessed you so you could walk around feeling guilty about what he's given to you. But he has also said in his word, to whomsoever much is given, much is required. A lot is required. And stewardship will, all of a sudden, you'll find yourself really studying how to steward what God has given you. What's the definition of a steward in scripture? A steward, even in life, is a manager of someone else's property. And so when you steward anything for God, it belongs to him. You're the slave in the house that is, is working it on behalf of your master to please him, to serve him, and happy to do it. What is the alternative? Serving Satan. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're not. There's no in between. What about those people that are good that haven't heard the gospel? Well, Romans chapter 3, Paul covers that. And the bottom line is God's going to be just. He's not petty. So get with the wrong crowd and see what happens to you and see how much damage you can inflict on others who love you. See how you break the heart of God and see how you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You who want to come to church, but really you want to get out in the world because you think that's where the fun is. Sin is fun for a season. And it's only fun for you for a season that season comes to an end. The flesh unchecked. If Satan cannot get himself worshipped, that's what he wants, then he tirelessly works to ruin your worship. If he can't get you to bow down to his interest, then he will try to ruin the interest you have. Go find a good church. And No, I'm not telling you to do that. <laughs> if you find a good church, Satan's not going to settle for that. But you don't have to be moved by him. Just be ready for him. Some of you have been here more than a few decades now. And, and you're hanging tough. Satan's not gotten to you. So he bypasses you and he starts targeting others. You think back when you were looking forward to coming to church. You're looking forward to the exposition. But something soured you. And if that church is preaching the word and you're soured, I would bet. Well, I'm not a gambling in a gambling sense, but in just the vernacular that we use, uh, I would bet that it's something petty. It's something of the flesh and the devil in cahoots with each other 
against you and against others. And this is, uh, he, he keeps doing the same thing because it keeps working. May we not help him out. And so if you don't check the flesh, uh, then you will cave. The condition of the, the, the flesh is a spiritual condition, always. There's the physical flesh. That, well, that's not the spiritual one, though. This, it can bleed over. We're talking about that spiritual condition. It can pretend to be spiritual and holy. Now, if you're coming to church and you're pretending to be a Christian, what, shouldn't that make you sick of yourself? Shouldn't you say to yourself, you know, I don't like this. I don't like putting on this mask, being the hypocrite. I don't like when others do it to me, and I don't want to do it to them. And maybe you struggle with it. Okay, well, that's why the pastors are up here after service. You come up. You don't have to give details, and they don't want the details. Just the facts, ma'am. Uh, just the facts, or sir, as the case might be. Uh, and uh, if, you're gen if you're, your pronouns are different, then we need to talk. <laughs> You're either going to get a rebuke or, or a, a prayer of forgiveness, one of the two. Anyway, uh, our flesh is, is totally beyond repair. My, my flesh, my flesh, and you tell me if this is yours, it needs nothing to be made stronger. Of course it is yours too. It doesn't have to study. You, as you do, the spiritual man has to, Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. Don't think, Timothy, that it's just going to have like, osmosis just seep out of me and into you. You better get to work if you're going to be a preacher of God's word. But the flesh doesn't have to do that. It, it doesn't have to learn how to behave. Ecclesiastes 5, Solomon says, you better watch how you, when you learn how to behave when you go to the house of God. Just don't go waltzing in there thinking that you're skipping into, you know, a saloon or something. The flesh comes fully assembled. It takes no effort for the flesh to catapult its dirt in the direction of another. It is equipped with a sword, with a shield, with a breastplate, with a helmet. It has body armor, just like your spirit. Its goal is spiritual mayhem. That's the goal of your flesh. And it does that by just trying to satisfy itself. And so we are to be armed against this invader for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. That's why God has given the church leaders, just for that reason. He tells us straight out in Ephesians chapter 4. He himself has given some to be apostles and uh, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ, until we all get to heaven. That's what he says. And if Satan cannot get you to abandon God, he will get you to ignore him. I don't feel like having my devotions. I don't feel like praying. He turns you into a carnal being where the flesh becomes dominant. To have your devotions, you know, there's a season in life where it comes very easily. You're loving it. But then there are seasons like you got to fight for it. Well, is it worth it? That's the question you have to ask. You. Is fighting for my devotion and my prayer time worth it? Or should I just let it just... Die on the vine. I have, um, I, I got from Sean last year some blue, a blueberry shrub and a raspberry shrub. And last year they were fruitless. And now I'm thinking about the parable. And so I'm digging around it before I <laughs> burn it. Well, this year there's a lot of fruit, especially the raspberry. And I'm trying to get to that thing before Winnie or Sophie or anybody else. <laughs> I know a bird got one of the blueberries. If I find that bird, I'm getting in the flesh. That's my blueberry. Anyway, anyway if they, Satan, uh, again, if he could just get you to ignore the fruit that God has made available, what will happen to it? What will happen to the fruit of my beloved plants if I just ignore them? Well, the fruit dies on the vine or something else gets it. And the, the, yes, the flesh can infect the, the body and the spirit. Satan will try to get you to forget victories, past victories in your life. That's why the Jews, Joshua coming out of, of, of the, the wilderness, go read the book of Joshua. Find how many monuments he was putting all over the place. They crossed the river, they put monuments, they put stones in, they put stones out. They were putting up these reminders of what God had done for them, because they know, they knew the flesh would forget it. And they wanted to combat that. 
And now it's in Scripture, and so it's, it's, you have this permanent monument in print. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. And there in that case, the flesh is infecting the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, that's going to take a lot. And there, they, Now, again, there are things in your life that you can't get the victory on. Don't you quit. Don't you blame God. You stay in there. He's not abandoning you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What part of that do you think he didn't mean? Well, if I mess up, well, if you mess up, he's going to leave you and forsake you? Then you, you make him a liar. Don't do that. Stay in it. Don't give up. God, uh, he, he associates his spirit with faith and faith with perseverance. But the flesh it has, of course, an unfavorable association. Galatians 3, this only I want to learn from you. You see how Paul is wording this? He's, he, is, he is pugilistic. <laughs> he is, when he writes to the Galatian churches, he is not being very friendly. Uh, well, he can't be. He's got a mission. I, I don't mean he's being mean or malicious in the flesh. He's not. But they had problems, and he was taking it to them. And he said, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or, or by hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? He won them. How do we know he won them? Because after this letter, we read of Paul going back to Galatia, visiting these churches with fruit. And so my, my last point, the flesh being subdued, Matthew 6 Again, Jesus teaching us to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Study this battlefield. The natural man lives in the flesh. The carnal man stumbles in the flesh because he's a Christian. The spiritual man battles the flesh all their life. Our inability to lay hold of power over sin does not render the Bible and its promises untrue. Just because you're struggling to get to a promise doesn't mean that God has failed you. It is a battlefield, every bit of it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, Godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You know why pastors really need to be gentle? Because the archers have sorely sought them. That's what God said to Jacob, uh, Joseph. The assassins tried to pick you off, Joseph, but your bow abode in strength held by the mighty hand of God. How are pastors assaulted? With the tongue, the mouth talking behind their back, saying things about them that they would not want to have said about themselves. I don't say this on my behalf because I feel as a pastor, God has always fitted me to take these hits, though I don't like them, I don't care for them. But I think of some other pastors that don't have some of the great people we have here. We have some great people that hold my hands up, and uh, we have a lot of them in different positions, male and female alike. Uh, I get blessed watching some of the children serving in the children's area. Uh, you know, they're seeing action as a child. I hope they make the connection between they're serving Jesus, not the church. If they think they're serving the church, serving the church, it's just a byproduct of serving Christ, of co course. But the main thing is they're serving the Christ, the redeemer of their soul. And so, yeah, gentleness, because if that pastor is taking these hits, then the flesh wants to strike back. And to do that, gentleness has to be thrown out the window. But if he, can re, if he can retain gentleness, if he can remember that there but by the grace of God go I, then uh, he has his armor on. And Satan cannot inflict a serious enough hit to stop the glory of the Lord. Uh, no amount of doing good can create the spiritual life. But when the spiritual life is thriving, good is the natural outcome. The spirit-filled uh, doing is the outcome of the spirit-filled life 
in spite of setbacks. I'm almost done. Don't forget that, I hope, all of us, in spite of setbacks, in spite of perplexities. Paul said we are perplexed. We are struck down, but we're still in it. And Maybe you have allowed God's ways to turn you into a cynical believer. Maybe you thought God should have given a blessing that you had cried out for and you didn't get it. And now you're becoming cynical. That's your flesh. That's not your spirit. Job said, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? Who has become cynical towards God and it has gone well with them? Not Pharaoh. Pharaoh saw the miracles. He remained impenitent. Speaking of impenitence, the thief, one of the outlaws on the cross, he remained impenitent. It didn't go well for him. There are powerful lessons in our Bible involving those who have overturned the flesh. The first one is David, Psalm 53, after his egregious sin. Psalm 23 says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In spite of all the things in his life, past, present, and future. Psalm 139, he wrote, I will praise you for I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows well. Oh man, how can you not love that? He says, he's saying in that Psalm, I am fit for this cursed world because you've made it so. I don't like it here, but I have what I need to have to persevere, to pursue righteousness and truth, to be gentle and patient, to have love and to have faith. I can do this. There'll be times I fail. You'll pick me up. There's the penitent outlaw on the cross, another example in Scripture of the flesh being overturned. What kind of life did that man lead to get himself nailed to a tree by the Romans? And Jesus said to him, I surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's, that's a victory. Then there is the prodigal son, and how does it go for him? He tells his dad, give me what belongs to me, and I am out of here. No more telling me to take out the trash, to make up my, clean my room, to make my bed, to do this, to do that. I am out, and he left. How did it go with him? He comes back home, humbled, and the father says, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be happy. That's what it says, and they began to be merry. Peter denied his Lord, and what, did, what was the outcome of that? Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. He got a promotion. He overturned the flesh, Christ did, because Peter stuck with him. Judas did not. Judas, Peter went out and wept bitterly. Judas went out and hung himself. One came back. He got promoted. The Bible says about the other one, he went to his own place. God has not promised us peacetime experiences in our faith in this life. He offers us armor just in our size. When you go to get your breastplate, it is the proper fit. And you're to take that armor and to line up with Christ and check the advancement of sin. I'm almost done. Doctrine, you've got to have doctrine. This is a doctrinal message on the flesh. You have to have teachings from Scripture if you're going to confront the enemy. This is the sword, that part of the armor, but it is also the shield. It is also the helmet. You cannot have your, your feet shod with the gospel if you don't know the gospel. So I'll close with two verses. Again, one I've already mentioned, Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That doesn't mean that they've, you know, once you cave into the flesh, you're no longer walking with the spirit. It means you're pursuing the spirit of God. Because if it meant anything else, all of them would be disqualified. The people I just read to you about the prodigal son who would have no chance. David would have no chance. The outlaw would have no chance. Peter would have no chance. And the final verse that lets us know we are built for this fight and 
in spite of the flesh, Matthew 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. What a thing to say to sinners saved by grace. He did not say, you are prone to sin, prone to failure. You stumble all the time. I can't use you. He does not say that. He knows who these people are. John makes that very clear in the second chapter, that he knew it was in all men. And knowing that, he says to his believers, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Let's pray. Our Father, there is no faith like this anywhere. It, only here, at the foot of the cross, does it begin. We who love you, we love your grace and your mercy upon us. We know we don't deserve it, and yet you're eager to give it. You're looking forward to seeing us at that banquet table in heaven, and you've put it in our heart to love this eternity that you've created. And may you find us to be scrappers, to pursuing, to getting up as many times as it takes to serve you, to bring glory to you, and to be a blessing to others, and not a drain on the blessing. If you've been listening and you've not opened your heart to Christ, and the realization that you're not right with God is upon you, and you'd like to be right with him, if you would like to be the spiritual, the spiritual man versus the natural, then you've got to make the confession of faith. You cannot come to Christ and ignore your sin. He did not ignore it when he died on the cross. How much more are we not to ignore it? You make this confession. If you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I, I have broken your commandments. I have gone against your will. And I ask you to forgive me all my sin and the sinner that I am. And I give my life to you right here and right now. And I ask you to be not only the one that saves me from judgment for my wickedness, but also the one who rules over my life, my Savior and my Lord. And now, Father, if anyone has prayed this, this prayer this morning, may they not be ashamed of it. May they step forward and own it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.